This additional tutorial covers some more key properties of plane waves. A very important thing is how to take derivatives of plane waves. So let's get the basic form of a plane wave up here so we know what we're talking about. So we might have an electric field amplitude. We might have some direction, perhaps x hat. And then we might have some propagation, k dot r minus mega t. So these are the main components of a plane wave, an amplitude, a orientation of the field, the polarization, and the propagation term, if you will, that tells you what direction the plane wave is advancing and how it depends on space and time. So that's our plane wave. So some derivatives that we encounter a lot that we've talked about in this class. So the divergence, I'm, not, I'm going to write this completely conceptually, the div of a plane wave turns out to be equal to i times the k vector dotted into the plane wave expression itself. Right, the plane wave is a vector. There's the vector component of the plane wave. So the divergence of this plane wave, remember the divergence is sort of like taking a first spatial derivative. You have to think about what, uh, how to write this in Cartesian coordinates and with x, y, and z derivatives, and I'm not giving you that here. But once you're taking that div, it turns out that the net effect of it, it's sort of like taking a derivative of this and bringing down a factor of i, k. So you bring down a factor of i, k, just like when you take a derivative of an exponential, and you're left with i, k dotted into the plane wave itself. This is not that different from remembering the time derivative. We've already exploited this one for any harmonically oscillating quantity, not just a plane wave, but it's certainly true that when you take the time derivative of a plane wave, that's just equal to minus i omega multiplied by the plane wave. You might be noticing that this isn't a vector here. Well, that's fine because the time derivative of a plane wave, the time derivative of a vector plane wave should be a vector. And we have here a, some scalar quantities multiplied by a vector quantity, the plane wave. The divergence of a plane wave should be a scalar, del dot the plane wave. And here we've got ik dot the plane wave. So we will get a scalar. And this also holds true for taking the curl of a plane wave. That's just, again, like taking derivative, bringing down an ik. And, and instead of del cross the plane wave, it's ik crossed into the plane wave. Some of these, this top and bottom thing are things that are being asked to be derived on a homework problem. But here I want to confront you with the, the usefulness of them. What, what we can do with this div and curl result is we can take we can use these to simplify the Maxwell equations. And one consequence that it has, this is a, something you'll be working on in class, is that we can pretty readily de derive from the Maxwell equations. You can qu very qu quickly derive that the magnetic field associated with an electric field plane wave can be gotten as just the k vector crossed into the electric field over omega. This immediately tells you that the magnetic field must be perpendicular to both k and e, which is something we saw for spherical waves, dipole radiation. It's true also for plane wave radiation. And uh, another thing that we get immediately from this div equation is that Maxwell's first equation for the divergence of the electric field the Maxwell 1 equation, when we're in free space, when we're in vacuum, that equation, the div of the electric field, just becomes I k dotted into the electric field. And in vacuum, that's equal to zero. Very simple result that k, and this tells us that k is also perpendicular to the electric field. This is what we, when we talk about a electric field plane wave being transverse, that the direction has to be perpendicular to the field orientation. All of this lets us make some useful observations about the average power in a plane wave. If we look at the average power 
that's going to be power per unit area, I should say. That's the average value of the pointing vector. And as we've seen from earlier in this course, that has a formula we've derived. Let's get it up there. So there it is, 1 over 2 mu naught, and then times the real of the E plane wave crossed into the complex conjugate of the B field plane wave. Well, because of this expression up here, which you'll be learning how to prove from Maxwell's equations, we can substitute in for B, and we can immediately say that that's equal to 1 over 2 mu naught times the real of E crossed into K cross E over omega complex conjugate. And if we follow that one along, one more step, there's some things we can pull out. The K vector for this simple plane wave is just a number times a direction. It's not a complex quantity. It will be later in this course, by the way, but at the moment we're in free space and it's just a number, 2 pi over lambda, times a direction. So we can pull out its magnitude, that's a real number, and the omega, the frequency, is always a real number. So now we're just left with the real of electric field crossed into, now we've taken out the magnitude of k, so we're just left with what I'll call k hat, which is the direction of the k vector, and crossed into E complex conjugate. I don't have to write complex conjugate on the k vector because that's a real vector, but I do have to take the complex conjugate of E. Now I can bring in a vector identity, which is that a, a triple cross product identity. Let me make that appear. It's often called the back of the cab rule, if you memorize it that way. And this, this equation allows us to simplify this triple cross product here. So we've, we've got 1 over 2 mu naught. We can notice the k of omega is equal to 1 over the speed of light. Omega is equal to ck, so we'll get 1 over c naught there. And then we're taking the real of two terms. So the back term becomes k hat vector, and then the dot product of e with e complex conjugate. And then the cab term is the electric field complex conjugate times k vector, k unit vector dotted with e. Well now we make use of another fact, which is that since we're in vacuum, k dot e must be zero, so this term goes to zero. So we've only got one term left. And so now we've arrived at a final expression. We have 1 over 2 mu naught. Let's just remember that 1 over mu naught is equal to epsilon naught c naught squared. And now we're going to get a final expression that looks like this. We're going to have a 1 half leading off there. From the mu naught, we're going to have an epsilon naught. We're going to have a factor of c naught from the c naught squared and that c naught in the denominator. And then e dot e star, look at what a plane wave is. This electric field dotted into itself, x hat dot x hat, that's just one. This thing dotted into itself, complex conjugate, will be one because we're going to have an e to the i something and an e to the minus i something. So this just becomes very simply e naught squared, the magnitude of the electric field squared. So we get an e naught squared, and we have the direction, k hat. Remember that what this is all equal to is the average value of the power per unit area. So we're in this plane wave, and we the power per unit area, if we stick a power meter in the plane wave, is going to be given by this quantity. 
I will just rewrite it one final time because the quantity one half epsilon naught e naught squared we might recognize that from deriving the pointing vector or from parallel plate capacitor problems this is an energy density and so it's got units of joules per meter cubed and so we can think about a, a plane wave's energy as being an energy density the plane wave has a certain energy density uh, in space and then that energy is moving at a certain speed and in this problem when we're in vacuum it's moving at the speed c naught and of course that's meters per second and it's moving in a certain direction k hat as we knew it we know that the that the energy must be flowing in the direction that the laser beam is pointing for this simple case and the units down here if we multiply these units we indeed get joules per second or watts per meter squared so we have a power intensity which is what the pointing vector is this expression for the pointing vector is very useful and you'll be seeing on your homework problems where you're being given the power per unit area in a laser beam and being asked to calculate the electric field strength of that that atoms would experience in that laser beam this is the equation right here that allows you to go back and forth between electric field which is something you might want to know on a microscopic scale how it affects atoms and something you can measure in the lab which is power per unit area very useful formula